my friends. I'm glad to see you made it. For we have gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. He's alive. Today, my friends, I, I want to talk to you today about Isaiah chapters 1. You know, that's the thing. The last video, if you've been following along, we went over Luke chapters 2 and, and 4 and some of the things that the devil was using to tempt Jesus and we see today that, you know, the devil uses the same tools, tempting us with the same strategy in the same way and the same thing. So the things of the devil aren't new, and it's not surprising to us. But sometimes what we come to find out is what's surprising to us is God and His holiness. So that's what Isaiah, right? And the name of Isaiah means... The salvation of the Lord, or the Lord is salvation. And not just the Lord, that's the thing, is the name Yahweh has been removed, and it would have been Yahweh. So, so that's what it was. And, and you know, I, I, as all this book, it's a book of judgment. It's a whole book, and that's the thing. What, what is the judgment about, and as Jesus says to all of them? already been judged already been judged you have already gone through it all in fact God spoke the end in the beginning and he spoke exactly what we were going to do and how we were going to live our lives even us here today are clearly spoken of through his word in the Bible so, so he told us exactly what it would look like Way back there. Now here we are. Same in Isaiah's day. This is a vision of a future time. Right? And Jesus gives us a vision of a future time. And what does that vision look like today? And we see it in the book of Revelations. The kingdom of heaven coming down from Zion. Resting right there in Jerusalem. And every eye would see it. Right? And then we, thousands and thousands of years later, well, where, where, where's the kingdom of God? It seems like the devil, evil, and violence are getting the upper hand. And so that's the thing I, I want you to understand is we, we, we are constantly rejecting our, our part in, in, in all of this. See, Jesus says, this is what, this is what it happened when, when I came in a thousand years is that still to come, still to come, right? And, and when he came, this is what you did, this is what you did, right? And, and so that's how he says and why he says the judgment has already been made. Has already been made. And everybody who doesn't believe in God is living under the judgment. Is living under the judgment. Right? And the only way to, to escape the judgment of God is to believe in Him. And this is what He says those who love Jesus Christ have eternal life. And Jesus Christ says to us, those who love him, obey his commandments. No. Oh. Commandments. <laughs> you mean I just can't raise my hand and say, Jesus Christ, come into my heart and save me, and then so so I can be justified to live in sin. To, to live in a place which I know grieves you, God. But, but isn't that what Jesus Christ come to, to release us from? Our want or our desire to grieve God's spirit. He wanted us to no longer be enemies to God, but to be sons of God. Right? So I want to read you a little thing of an introduction before we get to the book of Isaiah. Because it says, The vision of the Lord... Enthroned in glory stamps 
and intelligible character on Isaiah's ministry and provides the key to the understanding of his message. The majesty, holiness, and glory of the Lord took possession of his spirit and conversely, he gained a new awareness of human pettiness and sinfulness. Isn't that what Jesus says? I come to give sight to the blind. Right? I didn't know I was blind. Right? Even though they see, they cannot see. Come to give hearing to the deaf. Even though they hear, and cannot hear. And all of a sudden, Isaiah can see. And Isaiah can hear. So, so what does a prophet of God look like? One who can see and one who can hear. And, and because he can see and because he can hear, he can give us a, a greater understanding of what's going on in the world today. Right? He says, The enormous abyss between God's sovereign holiness and man's sin overwhelmed the prophet. Overwhelmed the prophet. Only the purifying coal of the seraphim could cleanse his lips and prepare him for the acceptance of the call. Here I am. Send me. Right? That's the thing. It is when God is in his house, we, we, we are now ready for the acceptance of the call. We see the disciples start out as fishermen and tax collectors and different people of different walks of life. But, but after the resurrection, they, they, they are now prepared for the call. And what did Peter say? Right? Here I am. Send me. Jesus, here I am. Send me. And so the prophets of God aren't the ones who, who say, Hey, let me pray for you. No, the prophets of God say, Here I am. Send me. Jesus training the disciples in how to be a son of God, a prophet of God. These are our ancestors, the prophets. Right? Okay. How do I enter into the kingdom of heaven? All right, this is what it looks like. The, the entering into the kingdom of heaven here on earth. This is what it looks like. As he's speaking to his disciples, there, there, there was this man sitting on the side of the road. And he had been beaten down by robbers. And they left him for dead, full of wounds and hurt. And a priest comes by and sees that the man is wounded and hurt, but decides to cross the other side of the road. Right? What does the kingdom of heaven look like on earth? A, a man beat down by robbers, broken, violated, left for dead, lying on the side of the road. And, and, and the teacher of God's word, a lawyer, a guy who knows the difference between right and wrong, justice and judgment, sees the man. And he too walks on the other side of the road. What does the kingdom of heaven look like here on earth? This man who's lying on the side of the road, beat down, broken, left for dead. And, uh, man from Samaria sees the man and has compassion on him. 
takes from his own pocket his own oil, his own bandages, dresses the man's wounds, covers them, picks the man up, puts him on his own donkey or in his own car, and takes him to the innkeeper or to the hospital or to a place where he may be nursed back to health. What does the kingdom of heaven look like here on earth? The man who says, here I am, send me. Priests, pray. And people who study the law don't get involved because of the fear of judgment. But, but the kingdom of heaven here on earth is the man who answers the prayer. Not the prayer, prayer, but, but here I am, send me. Jesus Christ showing his disciples, what does it look like to please God? To be the answer to someone's prayer. And he says, who, who on earth's prayers do need to be answered? He says, son, whatever you do for the least, you did it for me. And I come back here 2,000 whatever years later, and bam, it's 2016. Whew, what happened? What's going on? And all of a sudden, we, we, we decided to go a step further. When you see a man lying on the road, beat down, broken, left dead by robbers, right? before you go and help him, make sure you check out his insurance card. His insurance card. Right? Because if you don't have an insurance card, has no value for care. None for you. But what Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven on earth looks like. Are you willing to enter the door? Jesus Christ says, this, 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 I'm the door and the gate and the way, the life and the truth. And if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it's wide open. Here it is. Come, you may enter. You say, what does it look like? What does it look like? The man who has compassion on his neighbor. What's your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Whatever you did for the least, you did for me. We in America, in our church, it's, whoever's doing the most gets the greatest reward. Is that, is that the gospel of Jesus Christ? Reward those with the most? Or have those who have the most have been given the most? Because God knows when your neighbor's in need, you're going to help them. Right? American way? No way. We, we could tax the food and each one of us have health care and I'm telling you it would put an end to crime. Drug abuse. And alcohol abuse. And many, many sleepless nights where families are terrified of tomorrow because they're all sick and they're all worried about who's going to be there in my day of calamity and troubles, problems, in American ways. No, when, when, when you deserve it, when, when you work as hard as the rest of us, and it's all about work, and it's all about what I'm doing, and, I deserve it because I worked harder than you. 
right? And, and it's all about work. And God says, do, do, do I need anything? And in fact, Jesus Christ tells to his disciples 2,000 years ago, our father, my father has many homes, many houses, many mansions, 2,000 years ago. And they were living in tents, in castles, in teepees. And, and we look into our homes today saying, hey, did these people, in the next 2,000 years, God will be with them in, in their homes, and, and they'll all live in security, and, and they'll all have a place of comfort, but, but woe to them, I, I feel for them, because they're going to sacrifice everything for, for the things of this world. Being deceived in, into believing that this shakable stuff is your heaven. Do you imagine Isaiah? Right, 2,500 years ago, 500 years or so before Jesus. Man, my, my descendants are, are going to fly across the world. My descendants are, are going to climb into fiery chariots. And within an hour can and travel a distance I could never do in a lifetime. And, and then it comes, and it's a reality, and, and we say, don't like it, hate it, it's disgusting. But, but what is it that we hate, and what is it that makes it disgusting? Our willingness to sin. No matter how glorious the world is and all the glory of the world is given to us, if we live in it while we're sinning, it's nasty. It's disgusting. And what would erase the nasty and the disgusting of this world? A heart filled with compassion for their neighbor. And you say, I, I, I'll live my life and I hated insurance and I remember when I was a little kid. Like an eight-year-old kid. I remember when I was a little kid back then, sitting in the back seat of my mother's friend's car, and they had a nice Camaro, man. I can even remember the car. And they were in the front seat having a conversation about, yeah, they're going to make it a law that, that we have to have insurance. Before then, it was there's no law for that. And I remember as a little kid, it, and it going ding, 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 ding. Wait a minute. That's, that's illegal. It's called slavery. Slavery. You know, it's amazing. I could tell you you're a slave. No, I am no slave. But, but you're a slave to the work. I'm not worthy of insurance, care. Or, or if I was beat down and broken by the robbers, I wouldn't be worthy uh, uh, of anything. Unless I proved I was worthy. Proved it. Through works. Different things. And when I proved I was worthy, I would receive the care, right? Here we are in this world today. And it divides us. It divides us. It makes like an upper class. And then you got the middle class. You got the Republicans, you got the Democrats, and then you got the rest of us. <laughs> and Christians, or, or whoever you are, the rest of us. Right? And, and where does that come from? From, from the insurance system, from, from a lie, believe, ma making you believe a lie that you're not even worthy of the care. Could you imagine the, the man beat down, broken by, by the robbers sitting there? And, and here comes the good Samaritan. Oh, no, don't hurt. Don't help me. I, I'm unworthy of the care. I, I bet if I was broke down and beaten and broken, and hurt, I, I, I don't think I could say the words. Don't help me. I'm unworthy. I, I would be like, please help me. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Of course. Please help me. 
I want to read to you something. Isaiah chapter 1 says, Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons have risen, have raised, and reared, but they have disowned me. An ox knows its owner, and an ass its master's manager. But Israel does not know. My people has not understood. Ah, oh, sinful nation, people laden with wickedness, an evil race. Corrupt children, they have forsaken the Lord, spurned the Holy One of Israel. Where would you yet be struck? You that rebelled it again and again. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot to the head, there is no sound spot. Wound and welt, gaping, gaping gashes, not drained, or bandages, or eased with, sal with slaw or, uh, oil. The country is a waste. Your city is burnt with fire. Your land before your eyes, strangers devour, like a waste. Like Sodom overthrown. Right? We see it today. The same exact things they were doing in Sodom. They, they do in, in, in all across America. And it's not just unbelievers. It's the preachers and teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ are doing these things. You know, you got a hundred million Christians in America. Not one of you care about each other's health. You put all the responsibility into a health insurance system, not health care, insurance. Insurance. Who's the good neighbor? The man who had compassion, which, which welled or, or came out of or flowed out of his heart. Not because I was told. Not because I had to. But because it was in my nature to. Right? We see it today. Denver. And they want to sweep and get rid of homelessness. And their answer is to line up police officers, city Street to street, corner to corner, and just walk through. And when we get to the end of the border of town, and then, okay, shoo, fly, shoo. <laughs> no, no compassion, no love, no care. Right? This is the richest nation on earth. Right? And. Christians and churches and church members don't even care. Not only do they not care about their neighbor broke down on the side of the road, they don't even believe they're worthy of the care. Don't even believe it. The whole body is sick. Everybody's sick. Every bruise, every welt, every pain that's distributed to our neighbor. Our, our father feels it. When his son aches out in pain, he feels it. And all that's the thing. We, we all know what it feels like to. to, to be neglected, to be ignored, and it's a painful place, and God feels it. That's the Jesus when he came in the flesh. Let me show you how much I feel your pain, brother. 
lying there on the side of the road. I see this is a prime example of all the welts and wounds and gashes. Where did that come from? Our unwillingness to acknowledge God's presence in our world today. goes on to say, And daughter Zion is left like a hut in a vineyard, like a shed in the melon patch, like a city blockaded. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a, sanct a few remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We should have be like Gomorrah. Right? And so, who are those remnant or those few? The, the disciples. The disciples. It was their witness of Jesus Christ that opened our eyes, that they had turned us from being no different than them who lived in Sodom. You know, that's the thing here. You're, you're, Losing out, you got to go back to the book of Jasher and read the story about Lot and his life in Sodom. What was going on there? You know, it wasn't about being gay. It had nothing to do with that. In fact, that, that, that's something that's uh, so far of a lie. It's nowhere in the Bible that that's what they were doing. In fact, what they were doing was torturing each other. Torturing each other. You know? They, they would steal anything they wanted. And they had absolutely no laws, no morals, no ethics. And they were all living in it. They were all doing it. You know? We'll go back through that story. I, I think we should study that story because how, how can I describe it if I know you don't know it? I, and the reason I know you don't know it, you don't read the Bible? Who reads the Bible anymore? And besides that, in the book of Genesis, when it speaks of it, it's a very short story. But if you had the book of Jasher, it, it goes a little bit deeper. You say, where does that book of Jasher come from? The Old Testament, it, it's... Thousands and thousands of years old, guys. It's taken out because Satan wanted to deceive you. And because you you don't have an idea when they say Sodom and Gomorrah, oh yeah, God rained fire on a bunch of homos. No, that's, that has nothing to do with the story. That's not what it was about. It wasn't at all what it was about. So, so, you know what it was more about? Just like the city of Denver. It, I mean, it was a, a mirror story of how they went out and, and take all the homeless people's stuff, steal it. Hey, man, my home is my home, or whatever, my stuff is my stuff. And, and sure, your one man's trash is another man's treasure, but it's my treasure. And if I did it to you, you would be violated. What if I came into your home? That's what they were doing in Sodom and Gomorrah. That they'd just come right into your home and tear you out of your home. In fact, that's what Paul was doing. Exactly the same thing. And, and, and Paul said, thank God for Jesus Christ. Or I would have been with the same fate as those. And Sodom and Gomorrah. And the worst part of it, Paul had God's word. He had the book of Isaiah. They didn't. They didn't. Had they had the book of Isaiah, had a miracle happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, they surely would have all repented. And it's for that reason they will rise at the resurrection in God. We'll have them standing at his right hand. And you who had the word, the word, and the fulfillment of the prophecy, 
yet still rejected God's presence. And will suffer the fate we all thought they suffered. You know, that's the thing, an American thing, you know, we look out and got all the uh, rioting and <laughs> protesting and had they known no man on earth or woman can be a leader of a nation unless God approves it. Unless God approves it. So they're all mad and they're all upset and what's got them all mad and upset is fear. Fear of, of, of tomorrow. I'm all mad and I'm upset of, with God. With God. Right? And here's Isaiah telling Hezekiah and the people, Hey, get ready. Here comes Babylon. <laughs> right? Here comes the leader of Babylon. Right? God's in control. Even if we're taken to a place of confusion, God's in control. We wonder what's going on in the world today. Nobody believes in God anymore in America. They believe in a false gospel, but they don't believe in a, in a true gospel. And unwilling to, to acknowledge. They're unwilling to acknowledge. The only way to be the good neighbor is if I go to the broken and say, here I am. God sent me. Right? I remember when I was a little kid, praying and praying all the time in secret prayers and secret places. And, oh, I really want to be a disciple. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The Lord, I want to be, I want to, boy, I'd give my whole life to be just like you, Jesus. And that was my prayer from a little kid till 20s. And, and all of a sudden, an angel showed up and said, Hey, one day you're, you're going to do these things for the Lord. And, whew, couldn't believe it then. But 20 years later, I believe it today. I believe it today. Prayer already went out many, long time ago. Now, what's the answer to the prayer? That's what we're all seeking. What's the answer to this stuff? Oh, my son, I was talking to my son. Dad, I think the end of the world's coming. All the fish in the ocean are dying. Yeah, that's exactly what the Bible says about. First the fish will die. Then all the animals. And then the people. What are you going to do, buddy? What are you going to do? Trust God. What else do we got? And that's the thing with God says. Right. And all of it. You gotta trust Him. Listen to the instruction of our God, people of Gomorrah. What care I have for the number of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of the whole burnt rams and fat of the fatlings. In the blood of the calves, the lambs, the goats, I find no pleasure. Right? That's the work, right? Sacrificing this work of uh, uh, trying to prove to God we are his sons. And the only way we, we will be known that we're his sons is by this whitewashed tomb. Through all these sacrifices. Right? We, we, we were devouring each other over sin, and because sin is the wages of, of death. That, that, that's what causes sin. That's why we die. That's why we get sick, because we're living in sin. Sin is here, not in heaven, but here. And while we're living in sin, while we're going through the process of dying, for that's the wages of sin, 
We need to have compassion on one another while we're going through these things. And when we think for insurance companies, right? Because the CEO of the company gets far better coverage than the laborer and the manager doesn't get the good stuff like the CEO, but he gets even better coverage than the laborers. And for you bum people and you homeless, you know, you got the government stuff and, you know, really, it's, it's just a band-aid, $500 band-aid, but I pay more money for insurance agents, buildings to house insurance agents, but then, then we do for the actual care of our house. Sacrifice. What am I sacrificing? My dignity. My respect. My honor. I'm so, it's like I'm ashamed to be God's son. I'm so ashamed to be God's son. I don't even believe I'm worthy to be taken care of when I'm broke down and beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. That's how, that's how corrupt this world has become. It's your brood of vipers, just like it says. And, and had Jesus Christ not come, this world and all the flesh on it would have been destroyed. If Jesus Christ had not come and had veiled himself to Paul, he would have went out and ripped every Christian from their home, beat them down, and left them dead. Thank God. He opened Paul's eyes. If it wasn't for Paul, we probably wouldn't have most of the gospel or the revelations or the unveiling. You know, that's the thing. The only way to heaven is to be like Jesus. They don't preach that message I bet no more. No, they, they keep telling you, you don't have to be like Jesus. You can't be like Jesus. But, but the Bible says the only way to happen is to be like Jesus. To be the one. It takes time to prepare you for that day when you walk up boldly. That's what Paul says. Walk up boldly. So Peter says, with great boldness, he walks right up to the crippled man and says, Here I am. Stand up and walk. Right? He says, In the name of Jesus Christ, you're here. Stand up and walk. And he did. And he did. Peter makes it quick. To everybody is looking, and they're looking at him in amazement. Who is this guy? Oh, there was nothing holy in me. It was the faith of Jesus Christ, which was already in him, that came alive and made him whole. Made him whole. All he needed was someone to acknowledge him as being God's son. He goes on to say, When you come in to visit me, who asks these things of you? Trample my courts no more. Bring no more worthless offerings. Your incense is a loathsome to me. Right? Your incense is like, you know, Catholic people burning incense and things all the time. Let me create a holy atmosphere by burning these incense and doing these things. And No, we cannot create holiness. We cannot create a holy atmosphere. What is holy? God's presence. And it isn't created by us. Right? He goes on to talk about the Going to the festivals and the new moon festivals and these things disgust him. And what is he saying about that? Like people who only go to church on Easter Sunday. 
or Yom Kippur or the feast days. Yet, yet, yet completely ignoring God. I was one of those guys. In between. And I'm not saying that, that finding God at church every Sunday, no. It's the acknowledgement of God's presence every day in our life. Every day. Not just Sunday, or Saturday, or Easter, Yom Kippur. Not just those days. Every day. What, what makes God sick is when we ignore Him. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know how God knows we're ignoring Him on Monday, Tuesday? When we believe the gathering of God's people is on Sunday. But Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven here on earth will be seen. When you walk up to that neighbor who's broke down on the side of the road and say, here I am, there's the gathering. When two or more are gathering my name, there I am. Right? Right. And if they agree on anything, it'll be done for you. I agree I need help. I agree you deserve help. And thereby, God's will has come to completion. Right there. Kingdom of heaven here on earth. And it all rests in this place in Jerusalem. Lord Jesus Christ unveiled to us that God is love. Love. And actually, His sons are sons of love. Love. Where do we see that message before? Who's preaching that? If we had a hundred thousand pastors and elders of our communities, why is there an argument over and over and over and over and over, over? Who deserves care? Right? Remember, I was talking to my friend, and Paul oh, here just looking for free health care. No. But everybody who eats food, even the food that's sold foreign, all food is taxed for the care of our health. It is the food that kills us, gives us cancer, breaks us down. Right? It cannot sustain us. We keep getting sick. Nothing can stop us from getting sick. Right. My friend, though, and I say, yeah, tax the food. No, God forbid that. Yeah, because right there's the power. Right there, you lose all power. Now you're equal to everybody else, and you're no greater or less than anyone else. Then you have no power. Or anyone else. Oh no, our food would be millions of dollars. But it's funny how we, we see giving people, insurance people, the, the authority over our health, our life. And they're not even a part, have any knowledge or wisdom of the care of someone's health. Only money. Numbers. That's why Band-Aids cost $500. You don't have a problem paying $500 for a band-aid? And if you removed all of that and put all the money towards the health, all of a sudden the band-aid's $1. And the human being receiving the band-aid is priceless. Priceless. Right? But that's the thing. It's all a reward system. They work hard and they get the reward. 
right? But what if today was our last day? <laughs> and it was his last day, and it's my last day. Is anybody's work, whether it was good or bad, going to save us from death itself? No. Only God. And God alone. God is salvation. And God alone is salvation. What is God? The presence of holiness. And it's not created by incense and sacrifice. What is it created by? An acknowledgement of the truth. God is with us. God is here. How do I know? Jesus says, how will they know? By the way you love them. That's how they will know. God is here. Right? Oh, by these long and glorious prayers. No. They will know God is here when you love them. Because God is love. Prepare yourself to be the one who says, Here I am. God sent me. says, come now. He says, oh, let me back up. He says, your hands are full of blood to these people. Wash yourselves clean. Put away your misdeeds from before my eyes. Cease doing evil. Learn to do good. Make justice your aim. Readiness the wronged, hear the orphan's plea, defend the widow, right? Come now, let us set things right, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they may become white as snow. Though they be crimson red, they may become white as wool. If you are willing and obey, if you are willing and obey, you shall eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and resist, the sword shall consume you. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How has she turned adulterous, the faithful city, so upright? Justice used to lodge within her, but now murderers. Your silver is turned to dross. Your wine is mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and comrades of thieves. Each one of them loves a bribe and looks for a gift. A bribe and a gift. Right? The, the, the insurance companies, what, what would a bribe look like? Hey, man, I'll help you out as soon as you uh, hand over the deed to your house. Or, or hey, man, as soon as you pay for uh, all this uh, $500 band-aid. Oh, oh, hey, man, uh, so you, you pay for my staff in my company that has nothing to do with your health. Pay for them first. And then we'll give you some help. That, that's like a bribe. I'll get you out of jail. I'll get you out of your sickness. Just hand over the money. Your self-worth and dignity and respect. Because you're unworthy of it. And this is what he's saying. I see you and I see what you're doing. Stop. So you may live. Find compassion for your neighbor. So you may live in the land of milk and honey. The fatherless, they defend not. Oh. 
City of Denver rounds up homeless people, the widows and widowers, and mentally disabled. They round them up. They do not defend them, protect or serve them. They see them as criminals, worthy of nothing. In America, they euthanize the homeless. You don't want to get sick. You're homeless. But but if you have got cancer, something, and you're rich, you got hope, man. You got hope. Right? And the widow's plea does not reach them. Right? And the widow's. Now, therefore, says the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ha! Huh? I will take vengeance on my foes and fully repay my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and refine your toss in the furnace, removing all your ally. I will restore your judges as at first and your counselors as in the beginning. After that, you shall be called City of Justice, a faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by judgment, and her repentant ones by justice. Right? So what is he saying? Same thing that, that John the Baptist was saying there in the book of Luke. <laughs> Produce fruit, and that keeps in with repentance. Right? Right? Because they will receive justice. What is justice? The, the release from the bondages of the pains and sufferings of this world. Right? What does that look like? A, a broken man on the corner of the road? And, and you releasing him from the bondages of pain and suffering that were inflicted upon him by the robbers and the thieves and this world. That's justice. God's justice. Right? And Zion shall be redeemed by judgment. Right? Well, what is God's judgment upon the world? He, he sees us and he sees everything he's, we're doing. And just as it says, Thank God for Jesus Christ, who forgives the sins of this world. So, so what, do, what do we got to do? What's the problem in America today? An unwillingness, unwillingness to, conf to confess who's sinning. And who are we sinning against? Our neighbor and God. And God. How are we doing this? By rejecting God's presence in our neighbor. That's how. Just like that. Why can't I see? When am I going to see the kingdom of heaven? I see my neighbor. What's going to burn off the dross? Is God going to destroy us? He's going to destroy everything but us. Because everything in the world but us is rejecting God. He goes on to say, Rebels and sinners alike shall be crushed. Those who desert the Lord shall be consumed. You shall be ashamed of the terebinths which you prized, and blush for the groves which you chose. You shall become like a tree with falling leaves, like a garden that has no water. A strong man shall turn to toe, 
and his work shall become a spark. Right? That's his work will become his identity, his self worth, his his reason of existence. But yet it was pleasing to God to make us. It's pleasing to God to give us all these things we have today. But some of us use the things as being more worthy than the giver of things. Right? It says, But both shall burn together, and there shall be none to quench the flames. Right? And so what is that saying? Those who spurn God, spit in God's face, or, or reject God, will, will burn together with those who repent and, and turn to God. One in, in fire, and the other with the fire of God's presence. Like Jesus said, the, the, the word of God consumed him like a fire. And nothing can quench it out. You know, that's the thing. When the Holy Spirit has baptized you with power and fire, nothing can quench it. Nothing can put out your faith, your love, or your compassion. And once your eyes are open and your ears can hear, Nothing's going to stop you from fulfilling God's will here in, in this world. It's amazing. Isaiah chapters 2 and 3. We'll get to that on the next video. Is he speaking to us? It says, in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above all hills. Right? And we see that today. We're 2,000 years, 2,500 years later. Nobody ever heard of Jesus Christ. And now the whole world knows not only who Jesus Christ is, they're willing to, to fight and die and kill over whether people believe or, or don't believe in Jesus Christ. And this stretches all across the world today. The highest mountain. The most talked about thing. The, the one subject that, that, that we don't talk about. Because there's so much passion for it. All nations shall stream toward it. Many people shall say. Shall come and say. Come let us climb the Lord's mountain. To the house of the God of Jacob. That he may instruct us in his ways. Right? For from Zion shall go forth instruction. And are we talking Zion? There in the state of Israel in this physical world? No, we're, we're talking Zion, the city of David. David. Not, not the dead guy in that grave, but the city of David and Mount Zion. And the place where God lives. Heaven is his throne. And so that's the thing. We'll get to Isaiah chapters 2 uh, on the next video. And then 2 and 3, and, and then we'll go to Book of Jasher. And we'll check out exactly what was going on there in, in Sodom and, and Gomorrah. And look and see. Is that what's happening today in our world? And, and, and if it is happening today in our world, who am I and what part am I playing in this world? Because we see that those things they were doing back then grieved God so bad, he rained fireballs from heaven until it consumed them all. And there we had a visible example what it means to grieve 
God's spirit. Let us live a life that's not grieving God. Let us see God living in the least. In the least. And the whole world will know. You believe in God. And the least receive the same care as the greatest. See you next time.